This is now the last in this series of the second appearing of Jesus Christ. In our first lesson we dealt with the surety of His coming, that He shall come. Make no mistake about that. Be sure of this. He shall come. Our second lesson dealt with the fact that it shall be in appearance, not private, but public in nature. But then the look for him shall he appear the second time. He shall be revealed from heaven. Our third lesson highlighted the disruption of the natural order that shall occur when Jesus comes again. In the day he comes as a thief in the night, Peter said, The heavens and the earth shall be destroyed. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up when Jesus comes as a thief in the night. Our first, fourth lesson dealt with the fact is going to be a noisy affair when Jesus comes. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Certainly not a secret matter, very public, in which God shall receive the glory. Our next lesson opened up this truth of him coming as a thief in the night. That Christ's return as a thief does not emphasize secrecy, but a lack of unexpectancy. When Jesus returns again, he shall come in an hour that you think not. And when he comes as a thief, he shall come to plunder, to rob, and to spoil all the resources of the ungodly. He shall take away what does not blend with eternity. Our next lesson dealt with the fact that his reward shall be with him when he comes that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Behold, I come quickly, Jesus said, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. Our next lesson dealt with a subject that is unsavory to many, but necessary, the punishment of the ungodly. When Jesus is revealed with fire from heaven, it is then that he shall punish those that obey not the gospel and know not God. They shall be punished with everlasting exclusion from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. Our next lesson was the glad note. To them that look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin. If you have availed yourself of the first appearing of Christ, when He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself, in the second appearing of Christ, He will be completely disassociated from sin. He will not come to condemn, but to save, not to confront you with sin, but to confront you with the things for which you have hoped. Our next lesson dealt with an exhortation. Keep the commandment until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The commandment was fourfold in nature. It consisted of fleeing what was wrong, following what was right, fighting the good fight of faith, and laying hold on eternal life. Keep that commandment until the Lord come. It will be a time of accountability, the coming of the Lord. Then shall every man stand before him to give an account for the deeds done in the body, whether they are good or whether they are evil. Our next lesson dealt with an exhortation also. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of God cometh. Be ready for his return. All the resources have been supplied for you to fulfill this requirement. And our last lesson dealt with this truth of eternal objectives realized. Jesus is going to remain in heaven until all the words spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began are fulfilled. That includes the destruction of death in the grave. It includes gathering together everything in Christ. It includes the saints of God judging the angels and judging the world and everyone being gathered together in Christ Jesus that has availed themselves of the atonement. And now we come to this final lesson. The coming of the Lord. Come... Lord Jesus, a theology that does not promote anticipation of the Lord's return is a false one. It makes no difference how good it sounds, how much scripture is incorporated into its statements. If the theology, the doctrine, the particular presentations to which you have submitted yourself, if they have not promoted and stimulated within you an anxious Looking forward to the coming of the Lord, you have adopted an erroneous theology. Abandon it forthwith and take hold of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that will teach you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Adapt the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that will teach you to wait patiently for the coming of the Lord. I'm alarmed 
that so few people are anxious for the Lord's return, that so little is said about it, that so few hymns sing about it, that so few people talk about it, it's indication that we are living in perilous times. May you be among one of those that renews an emphasis on the Lord's return and making preparation for it. Our text for this session is found in Revelation, the 20th chapter, 22nd chapter, and verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one that testified the things in the book of Revelation. He's the one that said, Behold, I come quickly. And John is the one that said, Amen. That's just the way I want you to come. What does this mean? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Jesus has said He was going to come quickly. John's saying, that's the way I want you to come. Swiftly. Not in prolonged duration. Without delay, when you make your move, I want you here. Quickly, come Lord Jesus, that's the way, even so. Quickly also means swiftly, without delay. Three times in the book of Revelation at least, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Now to explain the word quickly, perhaps some illustrations from Scripture will serve to clarify it. When Jesus rose from the dead and the women confronted him in Matthew 28 and verse 7, they were told, And go quickly and tell his disciples by an angel that spoke with them. Quickly, without delay, without hesitation. When Jesus came to the home of Mary and Martha after Lazarus had passed away, it said of Mary in John 11, 29 that she rose quickly and came to him without delay, without hesitation. In Acts, the 22nd chapter, in verse 18, Paul was admonished to get up and quickly get out of Jerusalem without delay, without hesitation. Quickly denotes that you know something that stimulates you. Jesus Christ knows that when he comes again at last, at long last, his people are going to be brought home to Him. There will no longer be a gulf between them. They will no longer wrestle. They will no longer strive against sin. The enemy will be rooted out of the land. Satan will be destroyed. And frankly, Jesus is anxious for that to occur. He's going to come quickly without hesitation. Now John says, He that testifieth these things said, Behold, I come quickly. Who is this that testifies these things. This is the Lord Jesus Christ that has been an observer of the churches. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus assessed the seven churches of Asia. He told them their strong points and told them their weak points. He told them that He was knocking at the door to get in, that He was discontent with what they did that was wrong and pleased with what they did that was right. That's the one that said, I come quickly. The one that's judging the churches. The one that's evaluating you now. That's the one that's going to come quickly. If you live in harmony with him now, you'll not be surprised when he comes again. This is the one to whom all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4 and verse 13. That's the one that's going to come quickly. The one that sees everything as it really is. Who's going to come quickly? It's the one that's knocking at the door of the church. Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, any man, will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him. That's the Jesus that's coming back quickly. He's trying to get you ready to receive him when he comes quickly. Behold, I come quickly. This is the one whose reward 
is with him. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, says Revelation 22, verse 12, to give to every man according as his works shall be. What a day that will be when he gives us our reward. It is a day when he has received his reward. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and verse 27 says, He shall present to himself at the church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And mark this down in your memory in an indelible manner. When Jesus gets his reward, you'll get your reward. Now, the one who's going to bring that reward is the one that's going to come quickly. When John says, Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus and precedes it with a resounding Amen, He has demonstrated true reconciliation. Jesus Christ has said, John, the churches, whoever has an ear to hear, behold, look at this, fasten your attention upon this, contemplate this, don't blot this out of your mind. I'm coming quickly. When John said amen, he was saying, I'm reconciled to you. I've got your mind. You haven't startled me with that promise. You have not arrested my attention from vain things when you made that promise. Your words are not an interruption to my course of life. I've been reconciled to you. I'm perfectly harmonious with this, with this situation. And as soon as you said it, I said amen. I acquiesce to the divine judgment. Now, an attitude like this cannot be accomplished by law. I could stand here and tell you, you have got to be able to say, Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. But that will not make it happen. The fact that you ought to won't make it happen. But when you see Jesus as He is, and when you avail yourself of what He's provided for you, the remission of sins and consequent glory, it will make you say, Amen. When he says, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's look at the logic of this cry. Why should Jesus come quickly? Why not come in phases? Why not come in a long, stretched out period of duration? Why come quickly? The church, those that have availed themselves of the atonement, those that have believed the gospel, those that are fighting the good fight of faith, those that are stretching toward the prize to obtain it and are fighting a good fight of faith and laying hold of eternal life, look at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ as their blessed hope. You want to make a child of God happy, joyful, jubilant. You tell him that Jesus is coming back again and his heart will leap with joy. It's the blessed, jubilant, vivifying hope of the church. You take this out of our theology and it will fall to the ground and crumble. The practicality of the faith is seen in the fact that we have a hope. A hope that can be laid hold of, can stimulate the heart. We have an inheritance reserved for us in heaven that fades not away. Jesus Christ is going to bring it with him when he comes. It makes sense that he would come quickly under such a situation. Not only that, but we're looking intently for him. To them that look for him. Look's not casual there. Look is intense. Peering intently toward the heavens from whence we look for our Lord Jesus Christ. To them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Not going to be gradual. It's going to be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We'll see him and we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. That's what we're longing for and He will not withhold an instant gratification of our desires. It makes sense that if we're looking for Him, He'd come quickly. We're waiting for Him. By the love of God, it's directed our hearts into the patient waiting for Christ, as the Scripture says. We're waiting for His Son from heaven. Soon, the Scripture says, He that shall come will come and will no longer tarry. And waiting days will be over and will be wafted into the everlasting environment of God and Christ and everything that's holy. Everything that defiles and he plucked out, he'll gather out all things that offend, the scripture says. Makes sense in a circumstance like that that Jesus would come quickly. 
every time we break bread at the Lord's table, if we do it with our heart, which I have reason to suspect that some have not done, if we do it with our heart, we are showing, demonstrating, displaying before men and angels that we're looking forward to the return of the Lord. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show the Lord's death till He come. That's the culmination point. Then we'll ever be with the Lord and we'll not be remembering anymore. We'll be in His presence forever. It makes sense for a situation like that to be answered by a swift and immediate return of the Lord. Behold, I come quickly. Amen. There's a reason why we say amen. There's a glorious expectation that has captured our hearts. We believe the true report, as the song said, glory to God. Hallelujah. The children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing. For our souls are growing light and our songs are on the wing. We are going by and by to the city of the king. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus says to such people as that, don't worry. I'm coming quickly. And soon he that shall come will come and won't tarry. And when he does, we'll be like him. For we'll see him as he is. If he is coming quickly, the transformation will be quickly. Thank God for that. Then we're going to move into our eternal house. The word of God tells us, and if the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, and it will be, we have a building of God, eternal in the heavens. Later in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, he tells us, He that hath wrought us for the self same thing as God, who has also given to us the earnest of the Spirit. God's made you for that new body that's reserved for you. He's made you so you'll be compatible with it, so you no longer experience inward warfare and conflict through all the ages of eternity. Among the camp of the redeemed, those that are ever with the Lord, there will never again be said, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Never again will that be heard. In all the annals of time and eternity, not one single time will a cry be raised up like is in Romans 7, 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We shall be liberated and quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul spoke for us all when he said, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This source of agitation, this source of conflict, this body that is housed by lusts and ambitions that war against my soul. Where is deliverance coming from anyway? Not in this world. Deliverance is coming when the king comes. He shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And once and for all we shall be transported away from the arena of warfare and conflict into the everlasting peace that reigns in glory on that placid sea of glass that's before the throne of God where there is no agitation and trouble. We shall rest our souls as we reign forever with Christ, world without end. And it shall happen quickly, suddenly, and it may be at any moment. Behold, I come quickly. My heart says, Amen. Come just like that, Lord, quickly and without delay. Now I'd be remiss in this opportunity to fail to tell you what awaits us when we're with the Lord. The word of the Lord says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trump of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first, then we shall be changed, and we'll rise, and together we'll rise to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Build up your faith by contemplation of the fact there's going to come a time when we'll ever be with the Lord. Face to face. There's a promise made in Revelation, the third chapter, in verse 12, that warms my heart. I personally, if I may speak candidly with you, am discontent many times with my progress in the kingdom. 
Sometime I experience cycles, it seems, mountains and valleys. I long for the time when the mountains will be lowered and the valleys raised. And there'll be no more spiritual cycles, no more hot and cold. No more times when God isn't as clear and perceptive to my heart as he is at other times. Revelation 3.12 says to those that overcome, he said, and they shall go no more out. What a glorious thought. No more out. No more isolation. No more sense of being alone. No more juniper trees where you think nobody else is around. No more fighting battles in isolation. They shall go no more out. That's up there ahead when the Lord comes quickly. Now think of the social, political, and inner agitation that characterizes this sea. This world is like a sea that casts its foam upon the wretched shores of time. The apostle said there shall be no more sea. Revelation 21 and verse 1. No more turbulence. No more agitation. No more irritation. No more conflict. No more regrets that are like the slime that washes upon the shores of life. There will be no more of that. No more sea. Think of this. There shall be no more death. Revelation 21 and verse 4. Many of you have passed through the streets of Magellan, so to speak. Descended down into the valley of the shadow of the death. Some of you have experienced the loved ones and friends wrenched from your grasp in death. I myself have experienced such things. My own spouse was taken from me at a young age. There'll be no more of that. No more will we stand at the graveside in sorrow, as even as those that have hope. No more will we look to death and shout, I'm looking forward to your demise. There'll be no more death. There'll be no decline, no dissipation, no downward trend. You'll never lose anything either in memory or in grasp, there'll be no more death. There'll be no more curse. Revelation 22 and verse 3 says, And there shall be no more curse. We live in the realm of the curse now. It's all about it. God has said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, he said to Adam. And it's all about us, evidence of the curse. We even bear it about in our body. But there... After Jesus comes quickly, suddenly, and once and for all, there'll be no more curse. There will never be an occasion for a rebuke. There will never be an occasion for an exhortation. No one will ever have to be stimulated to awake from spiritual slumber and sleep. But ever with the Lord, we shall fly on the wings of a dove, as it were, as eternity rolls her ceaseless cycles on, there'll be no more death. Then he's going to gather out all things that offend, and we shall be in a realm in which there is no competition. I want to share with you in closing one of the promises of Daniel the prophet, who was a prophet that spoke ahead of his time. God told him to shut up the words of his prophecy that it wasn't going to occur during his time, but I now speak of a time when it shall occur, after Jesus comes quickly. It's Daniel, the seventh chapter, verses 18, 22, and 27. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. The time's coming when you'll be the head and not the tail. You may not be able to change circumstances now, Things may appear not to be working out to your advantage at all times now. 
It may seem like others are on top of the situation, but the day is coming when the saints are going to take the kingdom. When God's going to say to the meek, inherit the earth. And when man who is made to have dominion over the works of God's hand is going to be given the dominion, will kick off eternity by judging the world and judging angels as a display of the effect of salvation. The drama of redemption has wrought in us the mind of Christ, and it will be demonstrated in the ages to come. Then it will be fulfilled this promise. If we suffer with Him, we shall reign with Him. And our reigning day is coming. Jesus said, He that overcometh will I give to sit down with me in my throne, as I also overcame, and am sit down with my Father in His throne. That's going to occur when Jesus comes again. No wonder John said, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. It's going to begin everything we've longed and hoped for and end everything that's been a vexation to our souls. Well, it's been an intriguing series to me. During these 13 lessons, we have dealt with over 400 passages of Scripture. I think I can safely say that there has not been a single, solitary one of them that has not been plain and apparent. We have not tried to compound the problem of the coming of the Lord for you, but to show you how God has actually extended Himself to make this plain. I have labored to show you the clarity of the apostolic doctrine. If we are saved by hope, what causes us to hope cannot be mysterious, vague, and difficult to understand. Now, everything is ready. It only remains for you to respond. I'm asking you to make a commitment now to me, and I'll make mine to you. By the grace of God, I'll meet you in the morning.